Thank you and good morning to everyone. Namaskar to all. Uh, I'm going to tell you a part of life of my story. Uh, and, uh, but as a way to convey to you and share with you a part of my life's mission and my worldview. I hope you'll share. Uh, this story begins from 1998, when one uh, April afternoon, I was standing at a crossroads in a remote village in south southwestern district of West Bengal. I was waiting for a bus. The bus was to arrive around about half an hour later. So I took my time to stroll around that place, that crossroad, and look at the vegetation. And then I realized that this vegetation around, which is a dense vegetation consisting of many old trees. This used to be a sacred grove, and the bus road had penetrated and perforated this through, uh, fragmenting this grove into two parts. On one side of the road was a small Kali temple under a few trees. And on the other side of the road, there was a Vaishnava ashram and a few uh, tea stalls uh, on the roadside, which you can see there. At, sorry. Uh, these tea stalls, and this was the tree. I could recognize all the trees there, but I, I failed to recognize this one, this particular tree. That was a bit disturbing for me because I was familiar with almost all trees and shrubs of entire eastern India, all the forest trees, but I couldn't recognize this one. I asked around with the local people. They also failed to give this vernacular name, excepting one old gentleman who said this was Bhadu tree a name I never heard before. Then the next month, I collected some samples of these leaves and flowers to send it to the Botanical Survey of India headquarters in Kolkata to identify the taxonomic identification. They took almost eight years to give me the name of the family and the genus, Vitex, but they were uncertain about the species name. In 2011, 12 years later, uh, one of my uh, botanist friend, Dr. Krishna Choudhury, he identified the species name tentatively as Vitex glabrata, but we were not certain because no uh, herbarium collection standard herbarium was available to match with. Life presented uh, me with uh, a miraculous uh, surprise gift. In 2012, I received a surprise invitation from the Royal Botanic Garden in Kew in England, which is the world's largest botanic garden and has the world's largest collection of plant specimens from all over, all over the world. Uh, I was invited there to speak on some ecological issue uh, on an international conference to mark the 250th anniversary of Kew Garden. I took this opportunity to spend one full day in the Kew's herbarium collection. And after four hours of work, I was ident able to identify the first collection of this bhadu tree made by the legendary botanist Joseph Hooker, who made this collection in 1850 from a place now in Bangladesh. So uh, I was able to confirm and identify this taxonomic position and this name, Vitex glabrata, for this bhadu tree. Now, meanwhile, in this period, between, during this period from 1998, my first encounter with this bhadu tree and 2012, over these 14 years, I uh, scanned the entire West Bengal. Uh, in fact, I covered 12 districts of West Bengal, uh, two districts of Jharkhand, two districts of Odisha, uh, Northern Odisha, and one district of uh, Bangladesh, Jashor, adjacent to West Bengal. So total 10,000 square kilometer I scanned. Of course, I took help of my friends, Friends of my friends, relatives, friends of relatives, relatives of friends, and many NGOs to help me in this. And the result after this 12 years of my uh, survey in search of another specimen was not successful. There was no other specimen known from this entire area, which confirmed that this tree, Bhadu tree, that I spotted in this Chandar village at the crossroads was perhaps the last specimen and the only specimen of the species, which means it was a critically endangered species, represented by one single specimen in the entire eastern India. This critically endangered this category was actually marked by IUCN, International Union of Conservation of 
nature and natural resources, and they have these you know, criteria by which you can identify a species and call it critically endangered. One is that the species must, uh, must be having less than 250 individuals in number, the habitat would be highly fragmented, and the area of occupation of the species, individuals, should not exceed 100 square kilometers, 10 square kilometer. Now, in this case of Bhadu, the area of occupation was only 100 square meter, because this was only one, and definitely you know, not less than, not only less than 250, it's less than two. So it was it's, uh, definitely a critically endangered species, which I reported, published this information, reported to the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resource, reported to the Botanical Survey of India, reported this to the State Biodiversity Board, but they didn't do anything to take any measure to protect this or uh, conserve this. And all this while, I also tried to uh, germinate the seeds because that's, uh, that's how you can multiply the species in the future. But none of the seeds were germinating. Every season it was bearing fruits, but none of the fruits and the seeds germinated. I tried, at that time I didn't have any laboratory, so I used all the common people's you know, conventional practices cold water, hot water, acid treatment, all of this, it failed to germinate any of the seeds. Then I realized it must be depending on certain animal for germination. There are plenty of trees uh, and grasses and shrubs who depend on certain animal for the germination and dispersal of their seeds. Cows eat many grasses and the grass seeds germinate only from the cow dung. The neem seed or the banyan tree seeds will not germinate unless it is eaten by some birds and passes through the gut of those birds. Otherwise, it may not germinate at all. The rhinos, rhinoceros in North Bengal, eats one particular tree called pitali in North Bengal, a trivia nudiflora. And this tree will not germinate unless the rhinoceros eats it and passes through its gut. So our bhadu tree must have certain animal, maybe a beast or a bird, which was absent from there because it was a busy bus route, so maybe the, the species is not extinct, but locally extinct, it's disappeared from that locale. As a result of this, Navadu you know, was not uh, germinating. The only option left to germinate the seeds was tissue culture, which is a very costly affair. So I contacted this National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resource, who has a specialized section on tissue culture uh, to revive those endangered species, and whose mandate it is to conserve the uh, rare plants of the country but they never responded. I contacted the State Biodiversity Board to help me. They never responded. I am sure they were, uh, they wanted to make sure that they won't make any mistake. Swami Vivekananda once said that the only people who never commit any mistake are the people who do not do any work. So those people wanted to commit no mistake. Uh, then I approached many of the laboratories tissue culture laboratories of Eastern India, seven laboratories. The only question they asked whether this had any commercial value, any commercial prospect of this Bhadu tree. I failed to answer. Therefore, they were not interested. They were more interested in papaya and banana and potato tissue culture. So the only uh, thing you know, left me, but I had no means. Uh, I had no stable learning. I had no monthly income and no laboratory. And then a miracle happened in 2014, when my great friend, uh, Mr. Abhik Shaha, showered his generosity on me and gifted me with a fantastic laboratory, a biotechnology laboratory to work with. I never imagined I would have this laboratory toward the end of my life. And the first project that I undertook with this laboratory was tissue culture of Bhadu. I spent all my savings to collect these tissues from 220 kilometers from my laboratory uh, had to transport it within eight hours of time, very fast, you know, in AC car and all of this liquid nitrogen, all of this. And because this was the first time in the world that somebody was making tissue culture of Vitex glabrata for the first time, so we had to, you know, hatch many of these kind of trial and error. After one year of rigorous experimentations, we were able to germinate only two saplings out of 150 tissue samples. We were ha very happy that two saplings survived. But two, number two is too vulnerable to grow out in the open, in nature. 
any kind of natural disaster or an attack from a goat would just destroy this. So I wanted to get at least another 10 specimens, I mean saplings, to grow them out in nature. When we were preparing to get those, you know, a new batch of tissue samples, the shocking news came to us that the tree had been cut down. The last specimen of the species was cut down because the tea owner, tea stall owner, under the tree needed some more space, so he cleared the space by cutting down. And along with that, the species went extinct from Bengal and Eastern India. I couldn't sleep that night. Anyway, uh, so these last two uh, specimens in our lab were the last two representatives, my test tube babies, which we transplanted uh, on my farm, conservation farm Basudha. Uh, and this was the tissue culture specimen. We tried several times more, but it failed. Finally, we transplanted these two. One in a village, in a tribal village uh, of the Dongri Akund people. They were very caring about this when they uh, learned about the story. And the other specimen I planted on our farm. And now they are growing every year, taller and taller, getting more flourishing. And seeing them you know, growing taller and taller, despite my own, whatever the stature of mine, my pride and joy becomes taller and bigger, seeing them. <laughs> but Bhadu is not the only critically endangered tree. Over the course of 20 years of my survey in Bengal, I identified at least four such critically endangered trees. One such is a very fascinating tree, Sita Patra, of which there are just five adult specimens alive, still now surviving in Bengal, just five individuals. Sita Patra is a, has a fascinating character, and this is the only tree in entire India which has this character, is that its leaf allows you to write anything. Your poems or autobiography you can write you know, on this leaf without pen and ink. Any kind of scratch mark on the leaf is permanent, becomes permanent with a black mark. That's why the name is Sita Patra. The folk legend is that Sita of Ramayana, when she was held captive in Ravana's you know, Ashoka garden, and Hanuman arrived in search of her, and he spotted her in the garden. He identified himself as the uh, messenger from Rama. Sita was overjoyed. She wanted to write a letter to her beloved Rama, but the royal captive had no paper, no ink, no pen, so she plucked this leaf from this tree and used her hairpin to scratch you know, or this one. And she wrote this love letter to Rama, which Hanuman couriered to Rama. Now, you won't find this, this love story, this love story in the original Ramayana. But all the sweet you know, folk tales are like, are like that. Hence the name Sita's letter, Sita Patra. This Sita Patra is that one. But nobody knew the botanical name of this taxonomic identification. I identified this in 2016 uh, when it came to flowering after 12 years. And I published it in a uh, uh, prestigious journal of phytogeography. And we identified all those five, um, I mean, the five trees by their locations with latitude and longitude. But this is also being endangered by the forest department's activity because of you know, plantation of exotic trees like eucalyptus that is taken care and it's being driven off to extinction. So I rescued this too and planted this too in our uh, conservation farm. A similar tree is another one critically endangered is Tamilnadia uliginosa. The name itself you know, implies Tamilnadia. It was originally finally uh, you know, identified in Tamil Nadu. It was fairly common, now it's rare all over India and critically endangered in, in West Bengal and Odisha. Uh, there are just about 200 individuals left. And it's fast dwindling because again, uh, because of the exotic plantation of eucalyptus everywhere. They are uprooting because this, there's no commercial value apparently. So these are the three species that we have conserved. We have rescued from extinction, imminent extinction uh, in our conservation farm in Basuda in southern Odisha. Now, these trees, I mean, I share with you these, these you know, the story of conservation of these. I am an ordinary man. I don't have any 
formal training in botany. I'm not a botanist, trained botanist. I'm an ecologist. I'm not an agriculturist. I'm not a biotechnologist. And I don't have any stable monthly income as a salary. I left salaried job. It was a high-paid salaried job uh, in 1996 to start conserving vanishing land races, vanishing varieties of rice. I started with that. Uh, so I don't have any stable earning. I don't receive any funding support from the government or a corporations or even NGOs. The only uh, uh, support that I receive are from individuals who donate from 50 rupees to 5,000 rupees according to their will. With this, you know, I would say uh, resource poverty. I'm not a resource rich person. Uh, I'm not technically you know, competent to do this kind of botanical work or tissue culture work. If an ordinary man like me can do all this without technical support, with the technical expertise or competence, and without any kind of resource richness, you can do it much farther, much better, much more than I can. You all have relatively stable income. You have some affiliations with some institutions, you know, whether it's government or company or your own company. You can do it a lot more. And you have to. You and I have this commitment to do this. This is our life's mission, to, to conserve the habitat that we are all living in. All things are connected in nature. And we have to find, all of us have to find or rediscover the umbilical cord of nature which reconnects us all with all the creatures around us who are supporting us, our lives, and fulfilling our lives with beauty and, and satisfaction. Not only satisfaction, the physical satisfaction of hunger and thirst, but all our you know, aesthetic senses as well. We have to conserve the rhinoceros so that the pita tree also survives and it can generate, uh, for the next generation, it can germinate its seeds. We have to conserve all the birds and, birds and bats and butterflies and moths so that they can cross-pollinate all the foods that we eat, all the vegetables, all the trees that we eat, you know, the fruit trees that we eat. And this is the only way that we can repay the immense debt to Mother Nature, Mother Earth, who has given us this amazing, wonderful gift of life that we are all enjoying. And we have to do that. This is our life's mission. Thank you very much.